Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the National Monitoring Standards and Ryan White HIV AIDS Program Part B Manual Overview Recipient Technical Assistance Webinar. My name is Kenya Young, and I will be your moderator for this webinar. A few housekeeping items before we begin. Today's webinar is being recorded. Both the recording and the slides will be posted after the webinar. This presentation will be muted until the question and answer section of the presentation. And lastly, we encourage you to write down your questions as they come up. You can also type them into the questions chat box located on the lower middle part of the screen throughout the presentation. And we will address them during the Q&A designated period of the presentation. Next slide, please. So the vision of HAB is optimal HIV AIDS care and treatment for all to end the HIV epidemic in the US. The mission is to provide leadership and resources to advance HIV care and treatment to improve health outcomes and reduce health disparities for people with HIV and affected communities. Next slide, please. I would now like to introduce Dr. Susan Robolato, Director of the Division of State HIV AIDS Programs for some brief announcements. Susan. Thank you, Kenya. First of all, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. We are pleased to be previewing our updated national monitoring standards, as well as the Part B manual. These technical assistance documents provide helpful information to ensure that Ryan White Part B programs meet grant requirements while implementing impactful systems of HIV care and treatment. Both the National Monitoring Standards and the Part B Manual are in the final stages of editing and will be available on the HAB website very soon. The ADAP Manual um, is also being updated and will follow shortly after. We will let you know when they become available via our email listserv as well as the um, HIV AIDS Bureau or HAB newsletter and other communications. So I'll move on now to a few announcements. So during the COVID-19 public health emergency, Congress gave the um, Secretary of Health and Human Services the authority to waive certain requirements through the Appropriations Act. This same language was included in the, F in the fiscal year 2022 Appropriations Act and HAP has determined which waivers will apply for the FY uh, 2022 awards. A letter with the information on the um, waivers in or on um, the Ryan White uh, website, which recently changed. So it's ryanwhite.hersa.gov website. And the email notification um, with a link to the letter and information on how to request the non automatic waivers was sent this past Tuesday, April 26. If you have any questions, please reach out to your project officer. Just a reminder too that the integrated plans are due December 9th. I know you probably are all working hard on them. Um, there is um, technical assistance available and um, you can find the um, resources and technical assistance opportunities on the targethiv.org website. Uh, also, the um, fiscal year 2021 Ryan White HIV-AIDS Program Part B Annual Progress Report is due July 29th. An updated um, Women, Infant, Children, and Youth, or WIKI, um, Expenditure Report Worksheet um, is now available. The updated worksheet was sent via the listserv email list um, on April 21st, and the worksheet is, will also be available in the electronic handbooks or EHBs. Also, just a reminder that the um, fiscal year 2022 Part B supplemental applications are due May 9th. And then we also wanted to remind you that the National Ryan White Conference is fast approaching. Um, the conference will be held virtually um, from August 23rd through the 26th and registration is open. So please visit the conference website for more information and registration. The conference website is ryanwhiteconference.hersa.gov. I will now turn it back over to Kenya. Thank you, Susan. We will now have a brief period for questions related to the announcements. Please feel free to enter your questions into the chat box or you can unmute yourself to ask questions related to the announcements only.
So it looks like there are no questions at this time. So we can move on to the next slide, please. At this time, we would like to direct your attention to a poll that we would like you to complete. As we begin planning for the DSHOP Business Day for the 2022 National Ryan White Conference, we would like to gain a better understanding of topics that recipients would like to see covered during our time together. Please complete the poll and select as many topics of interest to you. Thank you in advance for your participation. Next slide, please. So today's webinar will be presented in two parts. Part one will focus on the National Monitoring Standards, Ryan White HIV AIDS Program Part B Overview. And part two will focus on Ryan White HIV AIDS Program's Part B Manual Overview. I would like to call your attention to the agenda for part one of today's webinar. During part one, we will provide an overview of the background. We will discuss the national monitoring standards. In addition to the purpose, the structure, components, implementation, and examples. And we will also allot time for questions and answers. I would like to now turn the presentation over to today's presenters. Dr. Susan Ribolato, Director of the Division of State HIV AIDS Programs, Aaron Nortrup, our Deputy Director, to begin today's presentation. Aaron. Thank you, Kenya, and good afternoon, everyone, or good morning. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. So let's start with some background on the National Monitoring Standards. The Health Resources and Services Administration, HIV and AIDS Bureau, established the National Monitoring Standards as a technical assistance resource to support Ryan White HIV and AIDS program, parts A and B recipients and subrecipients in meeting federal requirements for program and fiscal management, monitoring, reporting, and oversight of the Ryan White HIV and AIDS program, part A and part B, and to improve program efficiency and responsiveness. Next slide, please. On this slide, you can see the statutory, regulatory, and program guidance documents relevant to the Ryan White HIV and AIDS program grants. As you move down the pyramid, the language used in the document becomes more specific and closer and closer to program implementation. The Ryan White HIV and AIDS program statute is the law passed by Congress and signed by the president that created the Ryan White HIV and AIDS program. Regulations like statutes have the force of law. Regulations are different from statutes because they do not go through the bill process of becoming a law or statute. Instead, regulations are rules promulgated by an agency, in this case, HHS, in order to implement a statute. They affect those who deal directly with the agency who is enforcing them. They're generally required to be published in the Federal Register for a public comment period, usually for a minimum of 30 days. And once the agency summarizes and responds to the comments, they must publish the final rule in the Code of Federal Regulations. Our most frequently referred to reg regulation is 45 CFR Part 75, or UAR, dealing with the uniform administrative requirements, cost principles, and audit requirements for HHS awards. We at HAB don't write regulations uh, because the Ryan White HIV and AIDS program statute does not give HHS or HRSA this authority. However, our recipients must adhere to regulations under other federal programs like 340B, Medicare, and of course, grant regulations. Next, we come to the HHS and HRSA Grants Administration policies, which include the HHS Grants Policy Statement, used for all grant recipients and part and topic specific notice of funding opportunity and notices of award. The NOFO and NOA each provide more detailed requirements as to how grant recipients can implement and spend the grant dollars. In terms of HAB specific policies, we use policy clarification notices or PCNs, program letters, and the policy notices themselves. 
Program letters are typically related to one specific issue and are frequently relevant to one part as opposed to the entire Ryan White HIV needs program. They are informational or reminders like stating that a PCN was re-released after having made further clarifications. Next, we have HAB guidance documents such as the Part A and Part B manuals, then HAB TA documents like the National Monitoring Standards, and each parts office or division has their own specific documents such as reporting requirements. Guidance is a legal term that di differentiates a guidance document from a regulation. Unlike a regulation, agency guidance does not have the force and effect of law. HAB TA documents are a type of guidance document. In this context, we're only talking about TA created by HAB or for HAB under contract. It is important to understand that the national monitoring standards consolidate requirements set forth in relevant authorities, such as the Ryan White HIV and AIDS program statute and the UAR and outline suggested standards for how recipients and subrecipients can meet those requirements. As such, the national monitoring standards do not establish or impose legislative, regulatory, or programmatic requirements. Rather, they provide guidance on how recipients, lead agencies, and consortia can meet requirements and monitor those who have been issued subawards. Versa HAB providing the national monitoring standards to Ryan White HIV and AIDS program Part A and Part B recipients does not supplant the recipient or subrecipient responsibility for reading and complying with all current and relevant authorities outlined in the Ryan White HIV and AIDS program statute and the UAR. Uh, next slide, please. So let's talk a bit about the structure of the National Monitoring Standards. The structure has been updated from three separate documents in a table format to one narrative document for Ryan White HIV and AIDS Program Part A and one narrative document for Ryan White HIV and AIDS Pro Program Part B. Each part-specific narrative document includes several components to include the executive summary, program, fiscal, and universal com components. Of note, while there are separate fiscal and program national monitoring standards for Ryan White HIV and AIDS program Part A and Part B, the universal component addresses general requirements for both Part A and Part B of the Ryan White HIV and AIDS program. Additionally, the executive summary is the same for both the Ryan White HIV and AIDS program Part A and Part B national monitoring standards. It provides high level information on the national monitoring standards. Next slide, please. The national monitoring standards are organized by legislative, regulatory, and programmatic requirements. Suggested standards for meeting each requirement are provided, including performance measures and methods, and recipient and subrecipient responsibilities. The performance measures and methods provide guidance on how to meet each requirement and recipient and subrecipient responsibilities outline approaches for meeting or verifying compliance with the requirement. I will now turn the presentation back to Dr. Susan Ravalado, the Director of the Division of State HIV Needs Programs. Thank you, Erin. So now that we have an understanding of the structure of the National Monitoring Standards, let's take a closer look at the standards included in each component. As mentioned earlier, the Universal Monitoring Standards cover both fiscal and program requirements that apply to both the Ryan White HIV AIDS Program Part A and Part B programs. On this slide, you'll see the various sections of the universal monitoring standards. Each set of standards is divided into major sections designed to allow users to easily search for information by topic. The document also contains hyperlinks to facilitate navigation for users. For example, users can move among sections easily and source documents such as the policy clarification notice 1602. Um, so it improves um, uh, accessibility as you're going through. Next slide, please. So on this side, you'll see various standards included in the program monitoring standards for the Ryan White Part B program. There are some similarities in the program standards between Part A and Part B, but there could be different performance measures and methods 
or the same standard for Part A and Part B, specific program national monitoring standards, which can result in different recipient and subrecipient responsibilities. So ensure that you are referring to your part specific program national monitoring standards. Lastly, similar to the universal national monitoring standards, there are links throughout the document to facilitate navigation. Next slide, please. So this slide, um, you'll see the fiscal monitoring standards for Part B. As mentioned previously, despite having the same standards um, for Part B, ensure that you are referencing your part-specific fiscal national monitoring standards to ensure that you are referring to the correct performance standard and method and correct recipient and subrecipient responsibilities. Again, there are links throughout the document to facilitate navigation. Next slide, please. Now we're going to switch gears and talk about implementing the information provided in national monitoring standards. To reiterate what was mentioned earlier, recipients are encouraged to comply with the um, Ryan White HIV AIDS program requirements as outlined in legislation, regulation, and further defined in um, grants policy and the HIV AIDS Bureau policy clarification notice and other documents. The National Monitoring Standard is a technical assistance tool that serves as a compendium for Ryan White programs requirements and that HAB's intention is that the National Monitoring Standards facilitates the Ryan White Part B recipients in their efforts to comply with the program requirements. This slide outside outlines some of those activities that HAB encourages recipients to engage in when implementing their national monitoring standards in their programs. So um, recipients are encouraged to um, review the standards um, and share the program with program and fiscal staff. Um, you should share the standards with subrecipients as appropriate. You can hold meetings with your subrecipients to introduce the national monitoring standards and clarify compliance issues. Make standards easily accessible to subrecipients and meet the, lead, the legal contracts, procurement, finance, and other government entities to familiarize them with the national monitoring standards. Next slide, please. And this slide um, outlines additional activities that the HIV AIDS Bureau encourages you to engage in when implementing the, the national monitoring standards. So again, um, you can review the request for proposals and contract language to ensure that they specify they are specific services to be provided and data to be collected and reported. Um, review um, the monitoring systems, processes, and tools um, for potential revision and updates and changes. Um, you can fully implement any needed changes in subrecipient monitoring, and then to implement recipient and subrecipient responsibilities. And please always, your um, project officer is available for additional questions or concerns. Next slide, please. So we've completed the first section of the training. And before we proceed um, with providing some examples of how to use the national monitoring standards, we will pause here for a few um, knowledge check questions. So the first question, why did um, HAB establish the national monitoring standards? Was it to um, provide? technical assistance resource for recipients and subrecipients for was it to provide a compilation of all major Ryan White program documents for use and compliance oversight and expectations was it to assist recipients in meeting federal requirements for program and fiscal management monitoring and reporting or is it all of the above we'll give you a few more minutes seconds not minute to complete. I'm getting close though. All right. So good. Uh, all of the above is the correct answer. The next question. All right. 
So the next question, the National Monitoring Standards establishes and imposes legislative, regulatory, and programmatic requirements. True or false? need music or something. I'm not a good singer, so I'm not going to sing. Get better at this. All right. Well, the answer to this one is actually false. The national monitoring standards do not establish or impose legislative, regulatory, or programmatic requirements. Rather, they provide guidance on how recipients, lead agencies, and consortia can meet requirements and monitor those that have been issued subawards. So you can refer back, you can take notes, you can refer back to slide number four and for the, for the authorities. So the next question, true or false, the structure of the National Monitoring Standards has been updated. All right, and the answer for this one is true. The structure um, of the National Monitoring Standards has been updated from three separate documents in a table format to one narrative document for the Ryan White Part A program and one narrative document for the Ryan White Part B program. Each part specific narrative document includes several components, and those include the executive summary, the programmatic, fiscal, and universal components. So just as a reminder, the National Monitoring Standards is a technical assistance tool to assist with compliance with program requirements. So the next section of the training walks through some ways to use the National Monitoring Standards through reviewing policy and program requirements. Next slide, please. All right. So first, let's go through an example of the universal monitoring standards. As you are aware, Policy Clarification Notice 2102 was released recently and outlines HRSA HAB guidance for Ryan White Park um, B recipients and subrecipients for determining client eligibility and complying with the payer of last resort requirement while minimizing administrative burden and enhancing continuity of care and treatment services. The policy clarification notice document provides the purpose and scope and uh, applicability, effective date and eligibility requirements. This slide shows um, what policy clarification notice 2102 looks like. As a requirement, a component of this updated PCN eliminated the six month recertification requirement that allows um, to allow Ryan White um, recipients and subrecipients the flexibility to conduct a timely eligibility confirmation in accordance with their, poli their own policies and procedures. Next slide, please. So remember, as we keep underscoring, the policy clarification notices are HRSA have program specific policies and the information found in the national monitoring standards is a technical assistance resource. So the national monitoring standards as shown on this slide provide guidance to recipients and, recip and sub recipients how to ensure that their policies and procedures align with policy clarification notice 2102. As you see, the national monitoring standards have been updated to eliminate the six month recertification requirement and clearly provide information on the ways recipients can ensure they and their sub recipients meet the requirement through adapting the provided performance measures and methods, the recipient responsibilities and the sub recipient responsibilities. The performance measure methods provide guidance on how to meet each requirement. They're 
and there are multiple expected performance measures for recipients to utilize when which include documentation of eligibility which is documented diagnosis of hiv low income status and proof of residency within its service area having eligibility policy and procedures on file documentation that all staff involved in eligibility determination have participated in required training and subrecipient client data reports. The recipient and subrecipient responsibilities outline approaches for meeting or verifying compliance. For this universal standard, the recipient responsibility section includes establishing a process and policies for determining eligibility and confirming ongoing eligibility, conducting site visits, providing training, reviewing data reports, monitoring subrecipient procedures, and ensuring eligible clients are receiving allowable services. Next slide, please. The subrecipient responsibility section has also been updated to reflect the eligibility determination changes with policy clarification notice 2102. This section no longer contains an initial eligibility determination and once a year, 12 month research uh, recertification documentation requirements section or a recertification minimum of every six months documentation requirements section. Instead, the National Monitoring Standards provides the recipient responsibilities in developing and maintaining client records that contain documentation of the client's eligibility determination through completing and documenting eligibility determination and client records, conducting periodic reviews to identify any potential changes that may affect eligibility and requiring clients to report any such changes, documenting compliance and documenting relevant staff training. Finally, the National Monitoring Standards provides the source citation so that recipients and subrecipients can ensure that they read and comply with all current and relevant authorities. Next slide, please. So let's take a look at how you can use the program National Monitoring Standards to ensure compliance with service categories. Um, the HIV AIDS Bureau Policy Clarification Notice 1602 provides program guidance for each of the core medical and support services named in statute and defines in individuals who are eligible to receive these Ryan White um, services. On this slide, there is an expert from the Ryan White HIV AIDS program legislation providing guidance on what Ryan White Part A and Part B support services are and there is also an excerpt on um, PCN 1602, which highlights the specific support service, other professional services. Generally speaking, the service category allows for the provision of professional and consultant services rendered by members of particular professions, licensed and or qualified, to offer such services by local governing authorities. The PCN also provides examples of types of services that would be considered other professional services. Next slide, please. The National, uh, the National Monitoring Standards, as shown on this slide, provide guidance to recipients and subrecipients to ensure that other professional services provided to clients are in compliance with the Ryan White legislation as specified in Policy Clarification Notice 1602. As you see, the National Monitoring Standard references to the Policy Clarification Notice and, and legislation and includes performance measures for recipients to consider when implementing the service category. So to ensure compliance with um, HAB guidance, you can see that there is alignment with the PCN 1602 to include the examples provided for what qualifies as other professional service as well as the program guidance on what activities are excluded from the support service category. Next slide, please. The recipient and subrecipient responsibilities outline approaches to meet or verify compliance. For this program standard, the recipient and subrecipient responsibilities outline activities that should undertake to ensure that there are documented 
documentation confirming that funds are used only for allowable professional services and that there are assurances that program activities do not include any cr criminal defense or class action suits unrelated to access to services eligible for funding under the Ryan White program, as outlined in the cited, so uh, the cited sources, which are the Ryan White legislation and the policy clarification notice. Next slide, please. The last example addresses allowable costs, specifically direct ca cash payments, cash payments in the fiscal monitoring standards. As a note, this issue is also covered in the program monitoring standards under direct cash payments, but for the purposes of training, we're going to focus on the fiscal requirements. So the Ryan White legislation clearly outlines that the Ryan White HIV AIDS program Part B grant recipients are not allowed to make cash payments to the intended recipients of services. The policy clarification notice 1602 further clarifies that this consideration that what is considered a cash payment, the prohibition includes cash incentives and cash intended as payment for HRSA Ryan White or medical and support services. Where direct provision of a service is not possible or effective, store gift cards, vouchers, coupons, or tickets that can be exchanged for specific service or commodity must be used. As an example, a recipient or subrecipient may provide grocery store gift cards for the food bank service category or transportation vouchers in lieu of providing the transportation, provided that the recipient or subrecipient administers vouchers and store gift card programs in a manner which ensures that the vouchers and store gift cards cannot be exchanged for cash or used for anything other than the allowable goods or services, and that the system um, are in place to account for distribution vouchers and store gift cards. Next slide, please. So the national monitoring standards as shown on this slide provide guidance to recipients and subrecipients on how to ensure that their policies and procedures align with legislative requirements as clarified in the policy clarification notice. As you see, the national monitoring standards includes a definition of cash payment and similar to prior examples, there are performance measures that provide guidance on how to meet the requirement. These include implementing actions specified in B1 of the fiscal national monitoring standards, which is the requirement that recipients provide subrecipients the definitions of allowable services, the review of policies and procedures to ensure non, um, not direct payments, and review of expenditures by subrecipients to ensure no cash payments were made. Next slide, please. The recipient and subrecipient responsibilities outline approaches to meet or verify compliance. For the fiscal standard, the recipient and subrecipient responsibilities outline activities for that each should undertake to ensure that no cash payments are made to individuals as outlined in the cited sources that are in the legislation and in the policy clarification notice. So next slide, please. So this concludes the overview of the updated national monitoring standards. And although the standards are not yet posted, they will be very soon. Um, there's always that issue of uh, last minute changes and it can be perfectly frank, the waiver letter coming out that we did in the announcements actually put us back a little bit, but not for long. So they are in the final editing um, in order to be posted on the HAB website, and we will be notifying you as soon as the updated documents are available. I'll now turn it back to Kenya. So next slide, please. And thank you, Susan. We will now have a brief period for questions related to the National Monitoring Standards Ryan White HIV AIDS Program Part B Overview Presentation. Please feel free to enter your questions into the chat box or you can unmute yourself to ask a question related to the presentation only. At this time, we will also reopen the poll to allow time or more time um, to receive feedback. Yep. We we did see the the ask to reopen it, so we're reopening it. Hopefully. You're welcome. 
So hi, this is Khabib. I hate to jump in. Um, we can relaunch it, but what, what I'll need is everybody to re-respond because it's going to clear the results if I relaunch it. So I'm going to leave it open, but please re-respond so that we have your information. Many questions. So it looks like there's a question related to eligibility. And so we're waiting uh, to hear your question. So the question is, I interpreted the oops, I interpreted the presentation to mean that we establish eligibility once and then determine ourselves how often to update it. Is that correct? So that is a specific uh, policy clarification notice 2102 question. Um, but but per policy clarification notice 2102, that it is that eligibility is determined um in the beginning and then there should be periodic rechecks of the eligibility based on what your um, program has decided and put in into place so again if we're going out on a site visit um and to use a specific example that everybody is always concerned at we're going on a site visit we're going to look at what your policy and procedure is for establishing eligibility and then doing periodic checks of continued eligibility while um, and making sure that you're following what you've set forth. So, and then when we did subrecipient site visits, we would verify that that is what's happening out in the field. Certainly. Thank you. And then the next question is, can you speak to any changes that we can anticipate with CQM programs? So, Again, the National Monitoring Standards and the Part B Manual aren't setting any changes um, for any programs. They're updating what, um, what the guidance has been, anything that has been changed in policy, um, any updates that have been made or clarifications that have been made in policy. So, and as everyone knows, our legislation um, uh, hasn't been reauthorized in many years. So it's, it's since the 2009 legislation. So we don't have any new legislative requirements per se. So, and they, so to say, I'm saying all that to say that um, the national monitoring standards or the Part B manual won't be setting any new clinical quality management program changes. So. Certainly. Any other questions? Next question, it looks like, how often are those periodic checks scheduled and will there be a program decision? Is it once a year? Is it every two years? So again, this is very specific to policy clarification notice 2102. Um, and I would recommend that you go back and review policy clarification notice 2102. And if you have questions, please reach out to your project officer because I don't want to, to use this, like, this forum for those specific um, questions because those really do need to be discussed um, with your project officer. And, um, and then you know once you review the policy clarification notice um, 2102 again, so. Thank you for your question though. And if you, you can always reach out if you, if you have questions that following. So 
So there is another question that came through. And this question is, should we anticipate major changes to the monitoring standards? So I would say that the major changes to the monitoring standards are what, we, what we've already reviewed. The formatting is the biggest change that it's more user-friendly. Um, but in terms of, um, you know, a lot of changes, it, you know, the changes have basically been updates to make sure, like, then that's why we put the example of um, what has been changed in policy clarification um, in um, response to the updated policy clarification notice 2102. We wanted to highlight that one because that, you know, there are changes in the monitoring standards subsequent to that, but it's really about the policy changing and then the necessary updates for that. So those should be the anticipated changes. They will be coming very soon and we didn't wanna put this off uh, any further um, because we do know that they're going to be published soon. But once, you know, if, if you do have quite, we are also planning on using time at our business day um, at the national conference to to review um, questions and things that come up once you actually get the national monitoring standards and the Part B manual in your hands. So, thank you. All right. There was another question that also came through, and this question is: When should we anticipate or expect the national monitoring standards to be released? I wish I, I wish I could tell you exactly, but I do know the Part B manual will be published um, first. Um, national monitoring standards, I, I hope so that, and the Part B manual really is in the very final phases of, uh, with the updates to the waivers made at the very last minute, um, there's some 508 compliance issues that need to be resolved. Um, but those we're hoping to get out, we were, they were actually, Hate to say this, they were supposed to be posted this afternoon, um, but that has been delayed a bit. So, um, but within the next couple of weeks, we're expecting um, the Part B manual, the National Monitoring Standards. We are hoping by the end of May. So, again, I, I, you know, I can't guarantee that, but that really is where we are with them. We're really at the final stages, and it's that final editing and making sure that they're 508 compliant before they can be posted. And I, I don't know if anybody has ever gone through this process of getting things posted, particularly the complicated documents with the 508 compliance, but it takes um, some work. So, um, but we are working uh, diligently and um, with the part uh, B, national monitoring standards, the part A ones are being done simultaneously. So those will be posted at the same time. So, thank you. Another question. Um, that came through and that question is, um, could you talk briefly about the updates in ADAP programs? Are there any additional ADAP specific standards? So again, if there, um, let me say, the ADAP manual is coming. So specifically with that, we will be looking at all of the policies um, or we have been, I shouldn't say that. We're not very far behind with the ADAP manual, but we're making sure that all of the um, policies are. So with the standards then, um, they have not, there is not um, a great deal of change with that other than what has been updated um, in policies um, uh, since, since the last publication for the national monitoring standard, so. Are there any additional questions? So there's another question. Um, how should very prob problematic discrepancies in the manual, monitoring standards, and interpretations thereof between the Ryan White Part B program and Ryan White Part A and eventually ADAP in the states, uh, let's see, in the states be best addressed? We have several conflicting areas impacting the, we have several impacting the eligibility and care services. And our POs have advised us to cross part unify directive guidance. And that is difficult for her to have to provide. So 
I would recommend that the discrepancies that you're pointing out uh, actually be brought to our attention. And that actually is a good point um, that I wanted to mention that as you're looking, you know, none of these documents, uh, we do our best to make sure that they're up to date. Um, they've been through all kinds of reviews and clearances at this point. But if there are issues with them that you're finding, um, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. Let us know about them. We do expect we in this process, we've been developing the process to do more real time or at least uh, more regular updates to them so um, that we can, you know, get the updates done more quickly and not have to redo the whole document to do it. So we do have a mechanism in place to do that. So as things come up and you have issues, um, you know, you find that there's issues or discrepancies, please do reach out to us. Um, you can always go through your project officer, um, but you also have my contact information and Erin's contact information on that will be available in the slide. So please don't hesitate to reach out if there's issues around that. So thank you. Thank you. There was another question and I can answer that. Um, this question is uh, asking if the slides will be available after the webinar. Um, this presentation as well as the slides will be posted to the Target Center at a later date so that you will have access to that. Another question, would it be possible to involve frontline staff directly when updated manuals or when the manuals are being updated? So that was part of the process of updating the manuals was to have um, them reviewed. So we have had people in the field review them um, at various stages. So that is part of the process. Um, but again, if as you look at the manuals and review them, if there's other, you know, other thing, things that are missing, things that are um, th that are not clear, um, please do reach out um, with the, with that information for us. So, one more question um yes and one more question you may have touched on it briefly with the previous question and this question is has hersa involved different state staff to assist in the review of manuals and policies prior to rollout so manuals have been um reviewed so we have gotten input um from the manuals from from recipients as well as consultants um people uh, that have worked in the field. So we have done that with the manuals. Um, as far as policies, um, it that is not um, one in my wheelhouse, um, but two, um, policy changes usually do um, result from input. Um, and then there's a rigorous process to go through that. So in some policies, there may be more input um, from the outside. Um, from, and when I say outside, I mean outside the federal government. Um, but again, it depends on the policy and, and what is being updated, so. Thank you, Susan. And are there any other questions that you all have? So it looks like none at this time. So next slide, please. I will now like to welcome you to the second part of our presentation. This section will focus on the Ryan White HIV AIDS program, Part B Annual Overview. Next slide, please. I would like to call your attention to the agenda of part two of today's webinar. We will discuss the purpose, the background, some of the changes, manual structure, and a lot time for questions and answers. I would now like to turn the presentation over to our presenter, Khabibi Brown Matthews, or Khabibi Matthews Brown, Senior Program Advisor for the Division of State HIV AIDS Programs to begin today's webinar. Khabibi. Thank you, Kenya. Next slide, please. 
So I wanted to provide you all with some background about how the Rhineway Part B manual has been put together and uh, information about the purpose. So I'll start with the purpose first. Uh, there are four things or four reasons that we put together this manual. It's one, to help serve as an orientation guide. It's a reference document. It's a tool guide. And it's an information source. And I'm going to talk a little bit about each one of those. So an orientation guide. This is really an orientation guide for new uh, Ryan White Part B recipient staff as well as subrecipients if you have them with sections explaining how the Part B program and some information about the Age Drug Assistance Program or ADAP are structured at the federal and state level. And it addresses the key issues and strategies used by Part B and ADAP where appropriate to broaden access to HIV care and treatment to persons in need. It also serves, as I said, a reference document for Ryan White Part B recipient staff on legislation, grant regulation, and program requirements, including links to source documents that you'll see throughout the manual. It's a tool to guide Ryan White Part B recipient staff in managing both the fiscal and the programmatic components uh, of your program, and specifically as it relates to the sections that are covered in the manual. And even more importantly, it's a source of information about where you can go to obtain additional information about the specific issue that's covered in the section, as well as technical assistance where appropriate. Next slide, please. So a little bit about the background. The target audience for this manual is for you all as the recipients, as well as your subrecipients. So it covers this really focused on our 59 recipients. So the 50 states, as well as the District of Columbia, the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, the Northern Mariana Islands, American Samoa, Guam, the US Virgin Islands, the Federated States of Macronesia, and the Republic of Marshall Islands, as well as the Republic of Palau. This manual was last updated in 2015. Uh, so what you'll see is updates from anything that's happened in 2015 on forward. And we do want to assure you that we will be uh, reviewing and updating the manual periodically. And what we do encourage you all to do is, as our recipients, to share recommendations on future enhancements, as well as any other feedback that you might have, whether it's related to the manual or not, uh, any feedback that you may have with your designated project officer, and they'll be sure to convey uh, the information to DSHAP leadership. Next slide, please. So I do want to go through a high level overview of the summary of changes. So as you can see, um, one of the main changes that happened is that with this manual, you'll now see incorporated requirements set forth in the Office of Management and Budget, which released the Uniform Administrative Requirements, which we at HHS codified as 45 CFR Part 75. So you'll see a lot of reference to that in the updated uh, manual. It also, uh, there obviously have been updates to the HAB policy clarification notices, so it covers all updates made, updates or new policy clarification notices that have been released since 2015. It also updates the language to reflect the current Ryan White Part B policies and procedures. So for example, if you go to section Roman numeral nine, which is planning requirements for Ryan White Part B, you see that it now includes a chapter related to the integrated HIV prevention and care plan guidance, including the statewide coordinated statement of needs or SCSN as it relates to calendar years 2022 through 2026. And then it also has adds additional information to ensure that you as a recipient understand the key issues. So some examples of that would be when you go to section uh, Roman numeral four, which is recipient and subrecipient monitoring, and now includes additional information regarding legislative and regulatory requirements for monitoring by all pass through entities. And another example would be section Roman numeral eight, which is entitled Grants Administration, and it now includes a chapter on Ryan White Part B financial penalties. Next slide, please. So I do wanna take a moment to talk a little bit about the structure of the manual. Uh, every section will start with an introduction and they will be followed by relevant authorities, then program direction and implementation, last but not least, technical assistance links and resources. So. Let me talk about introductions, it's pretty self-explanatory. So the introduction section introduces the topic area for discussion in this section, and it also uh, provides information about why that section is important. And then it pivots 
normally like chapter two, it pivots to relevant authorities. So it reviews Ryan White HIV-AIDS program legislation, as well as applicable regulatory requirements, grant administration policies, and program-specific policies that authorize and establish requirements as it relates to the topic that's being covered in that specific section. And then it will provide program direction and implementation. So it provides explanation of relevant authorities and division guidance to help enhance your understanding of your roles and responsibility as a recipient in meeting the program requirements and improving the systems of HIV prevention, care, and treatment in your specific state or territory. And then it wraps up again with technical assistant links and resources. So we provide hyperlinks that are up to date. So hyperlinks uh, to tools, instruction manuals, and other documents that can further enhance your understanding or support of implementation of the topics that are introduced in each section. I do want to note for you all that the first few sections of the manual are most helpful to those that are unfamiliar with the Part B program as well as ADAP. And so this is really uh, a good tool for you to use with any new staff that you may have. As it provides, these sections provide a comprehensive overview uh, and sources for additional information and assistance for that new employee as they're getting acclimated. And then you'll see that in the subsequent sections, uh, it covers more of the Part B management and technical issues in more detail for some of your more seasoned staff. But we do wanna encourage you to uh, be familiar with the entire manual because there are some rich nuggets of information in there for you. So next slide, please. I would like to quickly walk you through an example of sort of the structure that I just talked to you about uh, and that you'll find in the Part B manual update. So we're going to talk about section Roman numeral five, which is entitled recipient and subrecipient monitoring. This, this is always a, a big uh, issue that we, we hear questions about. So chapter one is what we've, again, we start with the introduction. So uh, here it says verbatim, You'll see this, these slides are screenshots from what's in the manual. So monitoring, whether HRSA monitoring of you all as our recipients or monitoring your subrecipients or the other recipient and subrecipient monitoring of contractors is, as we've always said to you all, a critical component of, the, of our program. So in this specific section, you'll see that there's a high level overview about oversight and monitoring responsibilities, both as you as our recipients as and your responsibilities as it relates to your subrecipients. And, and you'll also find information regarding useful tools that can assist with providing oversight of your subrecipients and contractors. So as you can see here, this introduction is short and sweet. Next slide, please. The next up, so chapter two, it goes into relevant authorities. Uh, so here, we took the opportunity to define, define some key terms as it relates to 45 CFR Part 75. So we provide you with the definition as it relates to federal awarding agency, uh, because we want to make sure that you all understand what those definitions mean to us, uh, so that we're all working from the same sort of source. We define recipients, we define pass-through entities. Next slide, please. We give, uh, we clearly outline as found in 45 CFR part 75, what the definition of a recipient is, as well as what the definition of a contractor is. Next slide, please. So then we then again invoke 45 CFR as part 75, and we provide you specific information uh, of sort of what areas we're looking at or that you have to be adhering to as it relates to 45 CFR uh, Part 75 as it relates to monitoring your subrecipients. So that is, again, we're telling you why we're able to do uh, certain things or why we're asking you to do certain things. Next slide, please. So then next up is program uh, direction and implementation. So uh, here we're talking about sort of what you need to do and what our expectation is. We're invoking again, 45 CFR part 75. We're reiterating uh, that 
it is very important that you are monitoring your subrecipients. So since it says, as was noted earlier, in Ryan White Part B, recipients are responsible for adequate oversight and monitoring of all activities supported by the federal award, including subawards and contracts. As such, the recipient must ensure that subrecipient monitoring uh, requirements are met, plain and simple. And then we give sort of where we came up with this authority, and that's uh, 45 CFR Part 75. Next slide, please. So program direction and implementation. Again, uh, next in this section, what you'll see is it says, all Ryan White Part B recipients are also responsible for ensuring the follow following and related activities. So evaluation of your subrecipient's risk, uh, monitoring your subrecipient activities to make sure not only are they compliant, but that they are achieving their performance goals that have been agreed upon. You have a responsibility to verify the audits, and then you need to have uh, take enforcement action where appropriate to address any compliance, non-compliance issues that come up um, with your subrecipient. Next slide, please. And then my favorite part, we give you links. So this technical assistant link and resources. We give you hyperlinks that are up to date and that you can visit as it relates to the section to obtain additional information to help you as you go about implementing uh, your various programs. So that was this was a high level overview. Uh, if you have questions, please, by all means, feel free to uh, use your uh, project officer as a sounding board. If there are questions that they can't answer, they'll be sure to engage your branch chief and reach out to me where appropriate. Next slide, please. Again, my name is Khabibi Matthews Brown. I'm the senior program advisor and my contact information is there. Next slide, please. So thank you, Khabibi. At this time, we will address any questions you may have related to part two of today's presentation. Please feel free to unmute yourself or to enter your questions into the chat box. Are there any questions? We have one question. Can HRSA provide their policies that they use for site visits? So Kenya, I can take that if you'd like. Okay. So the policies that we use for site visits, so what we use when we go on a site visit to see that there's compliances are all on the um, HAB website. So it's Ryan White dot hrsa hersa dot gov we can put the link um in um the chat but all of those pol the policies that we use for site visits are all the ones that are that are posted so and then as you know we've been saying the national monitoring standards is you know states what those policies you know what the requirements are what policies or uh, statutory um or um uniform um require uniform administrative requirements are um that that can tell us basically that you that we gives us the authority to tell you you have to do this but again it's you know there isn't anything that we use outside of those policies when we're on site visits so that answers your question and thank you, Khabibi. She put the um, link in the chat to the HAB website. And those, those we recommend that you bookmark, know where they are, share them with all of your stakeholders and subrecipients so that everybody knows what, you know, what the requirements are. So thank and you. if you're so inclined, read the legislation, which is also on the website. especially if you need, for most people that puts them to sleep, so. <laughs> Are there any other questions or any additional questions?
Just some feedback um, from Kimberly Scott. We appreciate the restructuring of the HRSA HAB website. Thank you, Kimberly. We do too. Although again, painful as we're trying to get things out where all the links get broken right at the end, so. And again, I just want to reiterate, as you look at the documents that we're posting, the monitoring standards and the manuals as they come up, and you have questions or concerns or you know suggestions, please do reach out to us. We try to take all of those things, um, all of that feedback, and you know uh, make changes accordingly. Although again, they aren't instantaneous, so it takes some doing. Um, but please do keep the feedback coming. So it looks like there are no additional questions that are coming through, so we can move on um, to the next slide, please. So as a reminder, HRSA is on four social media platforms. We encourage you to follow along and share our content on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram to stay up to date on the latest HRSA news. Our account handle on each platform is at hrsa.gov. Additionally, we also encourage you to sign up for HRSA e-news, a bi-weekly email of comprehensive HRSA news, and to sign up for HRSA press releases. You can also visit our website at www.hrsa.gov for more detailed information about all of our programs. This concludes our webinar for today. Thank you so much for attending. And as a reminder, today's webinar has been recorded and will be posted on Target HIV at a later date. Recipients will be notified when the recording is, is available via email. Have a wonderful day and thank you.